Welcome to lecture 26 of PDEs. Today we'll be looking at using Matei's functions to describe the wave equation on an elliptic membrane. We'll look at the Stumlivel expansion to help solve Matei's equation analytically. We'll explore the zeros associated with Matei's equation which influence the frequencies on the elliptical membrane. And then finally we'll look at the eigenvalue dependence on the parameters. In lecture 23, we started deriving, using the method of separation of variables, a means of finding a solution to the wave equation on the ellipse. And let me just bring up the main e equations we found. So we basically found that the solution could be written in the form which is basically the sum of several functions of the variables independently, where xc1 and xc2 are elliptic coordinates in which the actual equation separates and which are separable on the boundary. We also found that our time dependence of the wave equation is just sine and cosine functions with various frequencies. And those frequencies, as I mentioned earlier, actually depended on the geometry. And I'll begin to explain how this occurs during this lecture. Okay, so here's our elliptical membrane. And just a sketch of the coordinates being used. C2 is equals to zero over here. And then once again increases to pi over 2 and again is equals to 2 pi, two pi back at this line. Um, C1 parameterizes the distance from the axes between the two foci minus D and D to the outer boundary. The maximum value which C1 achieves is achieved on this dark blue line. We also found that after we'd separated variables where both lambda and, in fact, um, kappa are the separation variables, or k are the separation variables, that the equations for p1 and p2 are described by the Matei's equations. So this is um, the modified or radial Matei's equation. Okay, and we're going to call it for purposes for the rest of the discussion A. And then the Matei's equation which is traditionally studied, is this one given below, which we're going to call B. Okay, and here, just summarizing what I already said, our separation constants are lambda, which arises when you separate the elliptic coordinates, and um, kappa, which arises when you separate out the time part of the um, solution. The focus is D. And epsilon is dependent implicitly on kappa as well as d. And epsilon, just to recall, is found over here. Okay, we know, as I've mentioned earlier, that c1 is the variable that goes from this line out to the boundary. And um, it enters into your modified or radial equation. And b we call the regular or the um, angular Matei's equation. And just to sort of get our perspective or to, to whet our appetite for what the solutions are going to be like, and firstly just for Matei's equation, if epsilon is equals to zero, right, then we're just solving the problem on a circle, and the eigenvalues are very easy to calculate because we've just reduced it basically once again to a wave equation with lambda. So the eigenvalues are then just n squared. Um, where n is an integer because the waves have to fit in or have to be 2 pi periodic. So in the case where epsilon is equals to zero, the solutions to Matei's equation B are either sine or cosine functions of n c2 or, n, or the sine function there, and, and recall that n here is an integer. And just to give you a feel for what the solutions will look like, Okay, before we actually work out the details of solving Matei's equation for any epsilon. So suppose now um, you solve the Matei's equation. Maybe I should mention that um, Matei's equation was initially solved, I think, when people started working out um, details of loudspeaker membranes. And in fact, these pictures... If you were to have a flat loudspeaker, you could actually produce them simply by putting some salt on the loudspeaker and seeing how it vibrates. And these pictures are the pictures of normal modes. So, for example, this first picture where you have basically no node 
um, along the sort of theta direction, in other words, where P2 is a constant, and you all, the only solution is basically you have a wave, which is like a hump that oscillates up and down. It's like the main mode of the drum. Over here, you also have no nodes in that angular direction. There's no angular dependence. But here you have the case where the central part pops, pops out, goes through the node, and a part near the, the, the boundary pops in, and then here on the boundary it's fixed, so you have Dirichlet boundary conditions. The moment you have a node in P2, there's a region in which the membrane becomes zero and stays zero for a stationary wave. So, for example, here where you have a solution, say, you multiplied everything with um, like sine of theta or cos of theta, you have a line here, in fact, this case is sine of theta, where on the x-axis the solution goes to zero. Okay, so you can already identify from these pictures the number of nodes you have um, in the solution, and it's indicated by these constant zero lines. So odd solutions are usually referred to sine theta, and so the first number is the number of nodes um, in, the, in the one direction, and the second one here, for example, if you have even nodes, suppose you have cosine of, of N or cosine of C2, here you would increase from a value that is non-zero, here it would be zero at pi equals to, uh, at C equals to pi over two, it will begin be non-zero over here and go on. So here is an example of an even mode where you have one node in the in the C direction, which is vertical. Okay, so this is an example of a cosine, cosine of C. Here is another example where you have an even node, so you just have one solution along the y, or zero along the y-axis, but you have three nodes in the radial direction. Okay, so generally the radial direction, if, in other words, this, the A equation going to zero corresponds to zeros that are like concentric circles or concentric ellipses, and the, the, when the angular or Mottet's um, ordinary solution goes to zero, you have zeros that correspond to specific lines that sort of go through, um, through your solution. And if they even, they're most mainly vertical, for example, here's one where you have even two, so you can see you have a zero that lies along there, and it lies along there. In other words, you have a zero, say, for example, over there, along constant C2, and its corresponding one that lies over here. And similarly, the odd zeros, where you have something related to a sign, lie horizontally, and here you have, for example, here you have a zero, one zero, here you have um, also uh, basically, you have two zeros, because you have one here, and then it across, and then here you have three that come in, so you have one, two, and three. Okay, so it's just to give you an idea of what, how the zeros in your Matthäus equation, both the angular part and the radial part, correspond to the physical pictures and the physical manners in which the membrane actually moves. Because you have Dirichlet boundary conditions, you have this idea of having standing modes or fixed modes. In other words, if you tap that mode and it begins oscillating, if you don't have damping, it's going to remain oscillating like that. Okay. And this, these pictures I didn't actually make, although I can make them, but they were taken from this journal article, which I mentioned because it's not only interesting for the pictures, but it gives a very good analysis and it actually gives a number of other solutions that can also be solved um, by solutions using Matei's equation. Okay, so it's a very interesting read. Should you be interested at any point to go deeper into the subject matter? Okay, so now the manner in which the nodes move and the manner of the frequencies you have um, is basically... Or, Rather, the, the, the num which modes are excited is set by the initial conditions as well as their initial um, velocities. In other words, the AK and the BK. Okay.
whereas the boundary conditions and the shape of the um, actual domain you're looking at fixes which frequencies are possible. Okay, so boundary conditions we have is the Dirichlet boundary conditions, as I mentioned earlier, basically that your membrane you specify as being fixed on the boundary and the displacement is then zero. And the second one is periodic boundary conditions because you want the solution that goes round in your C2 direction to be equal to that, the, mo as we, the same solution if you add 2 pi. In other words, um, going around twice makes no difference, which is a physical restraint. And then that fixes the eigenfunctions, right? Just like in the spherical case, the angular condition fixes it to sine and cosine, you have the generalization when you become an ellipse. And in other words, where you change um, the epsilon using that parameter d. And the discrete frequencies, as we'll so see later on, how to, as we will calculate later on, actually are related to these separation constants, and we'll look at exactly how this has happened. Just a simple example here, if epsilon is zero, we're on a circle, the discrete frequencies you get are simply lambda equals to n squared. Okay, lambda is a separation constant. It can only take on quadratic integer values, and therefore your frequencies are determined by that. Okay, and the means which, uh, the means method in which you calculate these separation constants are used, uh, is basically the Stumbler rule theory that we've looked at in the previous few lectures. Okay, so it gives a very nice realistic realization or physical realization of what Stumbler rule theory does within, with a particular application of the wave equation. If you want to look at Stumler rule theory and other elliptic problems, please refer to this reference. Okay, but I'm going to go at it in some detail during this lecture and possibly the next one. Okay, so now we're basically going to step away from, for a while at least, from our uh, PDE system and simply examine Matei's equation per se and find solutions for it. And we're actually going to use an application of the Stumlerville expansions we discussed in the previous lecture to, act to find the solution in a very, very cute way. Okay, so we aim is to solve Matei's equation. We want periodic boundary cost conditions, and we only want to solve in the domain from 0 to 2 pi. Okay, so, and the way we do it is basically to expand on an eigenfunction set, complete basis, that we know. So the way we're going to do it is we're simply going to apply the theorem we derived in the previous lecture is say let's consider the set of eigenfunctions yn of x with eigenvalues lambda pi and solve the Stumlerville problem that solve the Stumlerville problem y double prime is equals to lambda tilde y. Okay, so we're basically going to get a whole bunch of basis functions which we know are sine and cosine and we're going to try and express the stumley volz solution, or the Matei's equation solution, on that basis. And it works actually beautifully. Just notice that I've already mentioned if epsilon is zero, this is an exact solution. Okay, and also note that we're going to require that solutions to this, to the, the eigenfunction basis, also obey the same boundary conditions as P2 as the function that we're trying to find the solution to. Okay, so namely what that does is we can now write down the solution and we're going to say lambda tilde is simply n squared because that's the only solution that is periodic on 2 pi. We're going to show that the y0 is simply the constant function and remember we, we need an eigenbasis to actually apply the theories from the previous discussion directly where the, the eigenfunctions are normalized to 1, which was just the convention that we were using. So, and because the integrals are over from 0 to 2 pi, we want that y0 equals 1 over the square root from, uh, of 2 pi, so that y0 squared over that domain is simply, integrated over that domain is simply 1. And so in here we also have y e n, which is our even basis functions with eigenvalue n, is 
going to be equals to cos n pi, and we've divided by the square root of pi, so that the integral of y e n squared from 0 to 2 pi is just 1. Okay. Similarly, here are our odd functions, which is sine n x. And by even and odd, I mean if it's even if you replace x with minus x, the function remains unchanged. And odd, if you replace x with minus x, you have to multiply the function with a minus sign in front to maintain equality. Okay, so then by the theorem that we worked out in the last lecture, we can always expand P2 on this basis, where these are constants we have to determine, and uh, it's a unique expansion, and if P2 differs from another P2, it's a different expansion. Okay, so those theorems from the previous lecture have direct application here. So, and we also have from the previous lecture's discussion that we can now find an expression for the expansion coefficients. And that is simply you take P2, you work out the, the uh, take the normal or the inner product with Y0 to get A1, and you, and you work out the inner product of that, and then you have A0. Similarly, AN is simply P2 with YEN, and BN is P2 with Y with the odd functions. Okay, and you should note that these expansion coefficients depend on the parameters epsilon and lambda, simply because we know P2 actually does, because it's dependent on the solution to this differential equation. Okay, so whenever we write down one of these parameters, we basically mean that we have An of lambda and epsilon, and Bn of lambda and epsilon. But now the tricky part is we don't actually explicitly have P2, but we do have some information about P2 that's given to us by Matei's equation. And the whole dance in solving this problem is to use that information in the most effective way to actually write down the conditions on the expansion coefficients and actually solve them. And you can do it beautifully. It's actually a beautiful example of how do you ac actually apply something you know of a simpler Stumleville problem to find the solution to a more complicated one with several parameters in it. So what we're going to do is similar to the way in which we derived Green's functions from the past. We're simply going to take the inner product of Matei's equation with the base functions. And when we do that, we get an expression for these expansion coefficients that we're going to explore in greater detail. Okay, so I'm just going to call this equation ME, Matei's equation and particularly it's B on the previous slide. And I'm going to take the inner product with the basis functions, and then I'm going to get expressions for AN, and I'm going to do it in a lot of detail, so that people that, so that if you have not solved the type of problem before, you can actually do it on your own. Okay, so what we basically want to do is take this inner product, and remember this inner product is just the integral from 0 to 2 pi of this whole thing, multiplied by the basis function ym. And we're going to do it for ym equals 0, ym is equals to even, and ym equals to the odd ones. Okay, and we're just basically going to express this whole thing here as me. Notice I'm multiplied through by p1x. Okay, so that's my definition of me. It's just this thing in brackets. Okay, so now I'm going to first do the easy bit, and then I'm going to do the harder bit. So the easy bit comes from the linear part of the operation, simply the second derivative with respect to x of p2 plus lambda um, p2x. In other words, it's that factor and that factor. So to get that, all you have to do is you basically apply the second derivative to this expansion. So the second derivative of, with respect to x is just minus n squared cos x. Um, and here's a minus n squared sine x, and then we add lambda. So then our solution is, if we make down this expansion for this thing, it's simply lambda times p2 
minus or sort of plus the second derivative where we actually apply the second derivative to cos. So the expansion of this thing is just given here. And just to warm up now, if we want to take the inner product, say with ym, it becomes very easy because you only you tend to pick out the coefficient of the derivative of the, the, the func in front of the particular um, basis function you're taking the inner product with. So, for example, the inner product of the section of Matei's equation with y0 is simply the constant term, okay, multiplied with that. Um, so, it's basically y0 is 1 over the square root of 2 pi multiplied by 1 over the square root of 2 pi times the integral of a constant from 0 to 2 pi, so just with left with lambda a0. The, the integral on the other side of your even sector of function, or, or the inner product of the even sector, section of sector of solutions or basis functions, is simply the coefficient of the basis function you're um, associating with. So y of em is simply cos of mx over square root of pi, and you take the inner product, so the only thing you're left with is 1 times the coefficient of that basis function, so it's 1 times lambda minus m squared over am. And similarly for the odd sector, you simply pick out this term over here, and that should be a plus. Um, so you have lambda minus m squared bm times that. Okay, so that's the easy part of picking out the sort of the linear part of the operator. Where things get more complicated is where we're actually looking at this one over here. Because there we have the inner product of cos 2x, p2x, where p2x is this expansion. And when you take the inner product with cos and, si cos, uh, with cos and sine, you now have to deal with that because it's only if you have a cos squared term of a fixed operator that it's non-zero, otherwise they cancel. So ideally you have to rewrite this expansion as a series of cosine and sine terms rather than one where you have a product of two of them. And that's what we're going to do next. Okay, so just to keep the useful information on the same slide, yes, P2's expansion again. And we're going to say let t be equals to cos 2x p2x. And we want to work out this expansion. So firstly, the cos 2x times a0 is square root of 2 pi is no problem. It just gives you a cos 2x term. But where you do get a problem is you have basically cos 2x multiplied by cos nx. And as I said, we don't want to have the product. We want to be able to clearly identify the, the, the cosine and the sine terms that appear once you take the inner product. So we're going to write this product using the, the cosine rule for the, basically the product rule for cosine. So cos 2x cos nx is simply equals to cos n plus 2x plus cos n minus 2x. And we're going to do the same thing for cos 2x times sine nx. And we're going to find that, that we rewrite that sine as sine n plus x, n plus 2x plus sine n minus 2x. Okay, so that's just using the, the product rules for the of two um, trimetric, trigonometric functions. But now we still have a little bit of a complication because now we are, for a given n, it's not so easy to see if you take the inner product, say, with mx, which cosine functions um, match. And to do this in a systematic way, I mean, you can take the, the inner product with here and then work it out in detail, but I'm just going to do it in a systematic way for all of them. And the way I do that is I simply rewrite the sum and I change the index so that it actually looks like a sum over cosine of nx. Okay, so I'm going to change the summation index so that we're still summing over the same index below here as what appears in cos. So I'm going to say let n tilde equals to n plus 1. Okay. 
So I'm going to have n tilde equals to n plus 1. That means that I have to sum n tilde, sorry, n plus 2. That means I have to sum n tilde from n equals to 3 to infinity. And I have to change this n here to a thing with, to use n tilde rather to express this. So n is equals to n tilde minus 2 <coughs> in front here. Okay. The next term, I'm also going to change the summation index so that when what appears in the sum is cos n something else of x, and I'm going to say let n hat, I think I call it, equals to n minus 2. So it's going to be the sum of n hat, which is equals to n minus 2, but I must multiply it with n. So n is now equals to n hat plus 2, and the summation goes from n... Minus 2 goes to n hat minus, so n hat goes from minus 1 to infinity. Okay, so this term is entirely equal to that term, but I've just changed the summation index. I'm going to do the same thing with sine um, below over here, and I'm going to say 1 over 2 times the square root pi of b n minus n tilde minus 2 sine n x plus 2 over the square root of pi times b n hat sine n hat x. Okay, so now I'm basically back into the state where I have a sum of sine, of cosine, um, and sine, a sum of uh, sine and cosine of n x. I just have to be a little bit careful. For most part, it will work. But I must be careful that these indexes start at different points. Okay, so I can basically put these two things in the same sum provided n is greater than or equals to 3. And so that's the next step, is I'm basically going to combine these two expressions into one sum where the coefficient multiplies nx for n greater than 3 or equal to 3, and then I'm going to add back the parts I missed out. Okay, so I'm going to say, fine, or rather I'm going to give them first... Let's take this part that doesn't have a, 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 a equivalent that side. I'm going to say, let n hat go from minus 1 to 2. So of a n hat plus 2 cos n x. And then I'm going to add the remainder from uh, n equals to 3 to infinity. And because it's just a summation index, I can just recall, name it anything. And there I have the first term a n minus 2 plus a n plus 2 multiplied by cos n x. So for n greater than 3, we now once again have the expressed t as a sum of cosine functions with a coefficient in front, which makes it very easy to take the inner product with it. And I've done, and you can do the same thing for the b coefficients. So here you have also once again from n, for n greater than or equal to 3, you can add the two, you, uh, both terms are there. So you have b n minus 1 plus b n plus 2 sine n x. And then you've got to add back these terms from minus 1 to 2 over there. Okay, and just be careful here where n is equals to minus 1. You basically have b 1 um, sine of minus x. But because it's an odd function, you can take the minus outside. So you have minus 1 b1 in front there, and then when n is equals to 1, you have sine in x, so there's that term, uh, but you have b hat 3 over there, okay, and then the last term is if b is equals to 2, or n hat is equals to 2, you have that this b you have b4, because it's n at 2, plus 2 is 4, sine in x. Okay. And you can actually do the same type of thing over here when you look at the cos term. If n hat is equals to minus 1, you have a1 cos x. If n hat is equals to 1, you have... Um, a3 cos x, so you have b1 plus b3 cos x. And then when n hat is equals to 0, you have a constant term a2 over 2 square root pi. 
And when n hat is equals to 2, you have a term a4 cos 2x, but it's got to be added to that term over there. Okay, so now we basically use a series and we work out the projection of t onto y0, and that's simply uh, a2 over square root 2, because when y0 occurs, when n hat is equals to 0. So that's, and then you, so you have n hat equals to 0, so you have a2 multiplied by 1 over 2 square root pi, but the basis function y0 is 1 over the square root of 2 pi, and you're integrating from 0 to 2 pi, so you're left with this after the integral is done. The projection of t onto y even 1, okay, in other words, the, you basically compare the cosine of x. As I mentioned previously, you have the a1 plus the a3, because you have cos of x times a3 plus cos of minus x, which is cos of x times a1, and then 1 over 2 once, once you work out the integral. Okay, so that's where that projection comes from. And then finally, when you take the projection of um, with cos 2x, you have the term that comes from there, as well as the term here when n is equals to 2, so the a4 term over 2. And then the easiest of all is the, the more general, oh, sorry, I'll wait for that, is the more general case here where you take the, the general inner product with y e3, but I'll write it after I've done b's initial cases. So if we now look at the odd functions, t of y0, 1, is basically taking the integral with the sine function, okay, or sine x over square root pi, so that's a half times b3 minus b1. And taking the inner product with t of y0, 2, is simply the coefficient associated with the basis function sine 2x. So that's b4 over 2, because our basis functions, remember, are sine of nx over square root of pi. And here's the general case, sorry, if n, m is greater than or equals to 3, we have the two situations where you take the even one, so that's basically the coefficient of the basis function cos mx over square root pi, so you're left with a m minus 2 plus a m plus 2 over 2, and if you look at the odd sector, you're left with this coefficient in front here, and it's b m minus 2 plus b m plus 2 over 2. Okay, so that makes it now very easy to work out the projections onto our basis, and all that remains is that we have to combine this with what we did with that linear part with the eigenfunctions that we did on the previous slide. Okay, and here we do it. So yeah, our full projection of our Matthäus equation onto the basis function y to work out the expression for the coefficients is simply this linear part that we worked out that's easy minus the projection we've just worked out of 2 epsilon times cos of 2x p2x projected onto ym. And so I'm just going to write them all down. With the constant term, we know that that should be 0, and that just gives that lambda times a0 minus 2 epsilon a2 over the square root 2 is equals to 0. The term for the even function 1 equals to 0 basically means that we have lambda minus 1 a1 minus epsilon a1 plus a3 is equals to 0. The next term, so once again we're systematically working out the coefficient, the terms that result that are slightly anomalous in the low order and then we're going to write down the general term. So the y of e2 is simply the linear term we've already worked out plus, oh sorry, minus epsilon times this contribution um, from square root to a0 plus a4. And then the general case, if m is greater than equals to 3, is equals to lambda minus m squared a m minus epsilon a m minus 2 plus a m plus 2. Okay, so those are all the even things, and that completes all the projections and the base functions for the even ones. The odd ones have a similar result. So you have the projection onto sine x, 
Matei's equation is just 1 minus lambda minus 1 squared b1 minus epsilon b3 minus b1. And the second sine 2x over square root pi is simply lambda minus 4b2 minus epsilon b4. And then for m greater than or equals to 3, you have this relation that holds. So this is where it gets really, really interesting, right? So even though we have not solved the Matei's equation explicitly, what we can get is we can express it on uh, basis functions for which we actually know the dependence of x, just sine and cosine in x. And what we can get is we can get a relation or rec recursion relationships for the coefficients of those of that expansion. And what is very, very interesting here is the way those recursion relations work is just look carefully over here. So you have your first expansion coefficient. If you know it, and we're going to describe how you know it, you can compute the second one so because a2 is simply equals to lambda a0 square root 2 divided by 2 epsilon. Once you know a0 and a2, you can compute a4 because it just depends on those two. Once you know a4, you can compute a6 just from the a, basically a4 and a2. So there's what I, that's what I mean by recursion relations. Effectively, a0, once you know it, and you know lambda and you know epsilon, determines all the even expansion coefficients. So even though you don't know the solution, you can write, down, you can write it down because you can work out the expansion coefficients. And similarly, with the odd sector, suppose you were to know a1 and lambda and epsilon. Okay, but be careful. Lam lambda, I specify, is determined by the boundary conditions, and I haven't set out to do that yet. We're going to do that next. Um, but if you were to know lambda and you were to know epsilon, then A1 is all you need to know to determine A3. From A1 and A3, you can then go and determine um, A5 using this relationship, A7, A, all the odd ones, A9, A11, and so forth. And similar, the similar thing is true for your odd functions. Okay, if you know B1, then you can determine using recur and you know lambda and you know epsilon using recursion relations. All the odd ones, are odd coefficients B, and here if you know B2, you can determine all the odd coefficients of your expansion B4. So it's a really, really cute way of writing the solution. Okay. And so, from what it appears so far, right, is for a given lambda and epsilon, um, only these things, these four um, coefficients are free, dependent on lambda and epsilon. And the rest, as I've said, determines all the higher order coefficients. And another important thing is your odd and your even coefficients decouple, which is kind of intuitive because you would expect that if you have a solution to Matei's equation and it is the prop it's odd, then you'll basically build it up of sine functions because there's no sort of symmetry that chooses anything else. And if it's even you would basically build it up of cos functions and this you actually see in the recursion re relationships themselves. So that actually makes it useful or easier. And so what this basically means is you have four different types of solutions that are associated with each constant you have yet to determine. And notice that we haven't yet imposed the fact that the boundary conditions give us lambda, and that's what we're going to do next. Okay, and I just want to write down the solution. So formally, this is the solution that is even uh, basically, and dependent on the the sort of the so basically the cosine expansion that is even. In other words, it depends on two n. You can simply write this way: the the cosine expansion that has odd um, integer values in terms in, inside here. You can write in this way, and you can they basically decouple entirely from each other.
because of the way the recursion relationships are structured. The odd value function, so the, function, the solutions of Matei's equation that reduce to sine when you're dealing with a circle, you basically write as this expansion in the case where you have even n or even integer inside here, and when you have odd integer inside here, they call it that way. And these functions are basically, they've been used a lot, so they actually have names, and this is why I've called them, sort of named them in this way. So it's simply the, ser the cosine series that is even, and the, co the sine series that represents your odd functions. Now the next thing is, Remember right at the start where I said when we are dealing with a boundary value problem where this, the initial conditions are distributed, you get the type of solutions where you can actually rescale your eigenvalue. I sort of argued that in lecture 25, and I just want to show you how this is arise, arises. So I've said, for example, a zero is free, but it isn't really. It's sort of this arbitrary constant that comes into your solution that rescales it. And just for convenience sake later on, I'm going to fix it. And the way I fix it is simply to say that our solutions to McTay's equation is now normalized to 1. Just as we required the eigen solutions of the cosine, our initial expansions, to be normalized to 1. I'm going to do the same thing for McTay's equation solutions, and that effectively fixes A0. Okay, so I'm basically going to say... Let's have a look at this. We work out this inner product, and it's actually easy to do because we just have the integral from 0 to 2 pi C2, CE, 2N squared. Okay. And that you can work out by simply multiplying out the series squared. And what then happens, only the coefficients that have a cos squared 2N actually contribute and you're left with this integral simply equals to a0 squared plus the coefficients 2n squared individually. Okay, and since a of 2n, where n is greater than 0, is known if you know a0 and proportional to a0, okay, in the following way, so you basically have a2 is equals to the square root of 2 lambda a0 over 2 epsilon, and you have a4 equals the square root of 2 lambda, a0 times some other factor. Okay, and it carries on like that because of the way these recursion relationships are structured. You can basically say, I'm going to choose a0 such that this sum is equals to 1. Okay, so that actually fixes the choice a0. So therefore, if you do this, have this prescription, you basically have four functions that are dependent on epsilon and lambda and all these expansion coefficients are prescribed once you know epsilon and lambda. Okay, so you're basically going to make the same prescription for fixing A1. You're simply going to say let CE, the odd um, integer values over here, let the inner project be 1. That will fix A1. B1 is going to be fixed by this, this condition, and B2 is going to be fixed by that condition. Okay, so now you've basically fixed all the expansion coefficients in your parameters. You have not yet fixed lambda, okay, and you're going to find out it's actually going to be a beautiful way in which you fix it, and it's going to make it very, very easy then to just write down the expansion of your... Um, basis functions to Matei's equation in terms of sines and cosines. So let's now do that. Okay, so let's examine this one type of solution that has is a function of lambda, epsilon, and x, and it's the solution that comes from the sector where we are simply looking at even cosine expansions. In other words, cos of 2x, 4, 4x, 6x, etc. And I'm um, also going to just carry the solution along so, because you can do it, you do it for both independently. So now what I want to do is I'm going to take a more careful look at the recursion relationships and actually try and find a way of calculating them so that I can pose the boundary condition lambda for which 
the zero actually occurs on both boundaries. Now I'm going to say let the Vm be equals to lambda minus m squared over epsilon. And I'm going to say let Rm be the ratio of the expansion coefficient at m divided by the previous one in a particular series, so divided by m minus 2. Or if here it's odd, it's once again, say for example, R5 is equals to A5 over A3. And then I'm simply going to write down the recursion expressions that we worked on the previous thing, on the previous slide, in terms of R. So if you look very carefully, you have R2, which is equals to A2 over A0, that simply equals to V0 of the square root of 2, okay, where V0 is just lambda over epsilon. And R4 is going to be equals to V2 over the square root of 2 R2. Okay, so to see this, just go back to the previous slide and compare what I've written down there, remembering that R2 is simply R2, or A2 over A0 and R4 is A4 over A2. Okay, and then I can substitute in R, R2 and simply simplify it a bit. And similarly, R3, if I look at odd integers of M, we're going to have R3 is equals to V1 minus 1. And then if M is greater than or equals to 3, we can express that recursion relationship. It somehow becomes easier if you start looking at the ratios of two coefficients. Okay, so you're going to have Rm plus 2 is equals to Vm minus 1 over Rm. Okay, so this recursion relationships basically allows us, if we know epsilon and lambda, to work out all the coefficients, or the ratio of the two coefficients up to particular m by going backwards. In other words, if, if we want the coefficient, let's say Rm plus 2, we can write it in terms of this function of just lambda and epsilon and m minus 1 over the previous one and then we can re-express re the previous one as the one in, in terms of 1 before that and this function vm. So just another way before I go on, but we can ha there's another way of looking at this as well. If we look, we can also say we can express Rm as 1 over, we can rewrite this thing in terms of Rm, right? So Rm is, can be equals to 1 over Vm minus Rm plus 2. So we can express, say, the coefficient at a particular point in terms of coefficients that are larger. And we can continue as that until they are very, very large. And the reason why we do that is that when we solve the boundary value problem, we want solutions that converge. In other words, we want solutions for which this ratio of AM over M minus 2 at infinity, that ratio eventually goes to zero because we don't want an infinite uh, unconvergent expansion. We're simply looking for solutions where you can r restrict the number of basis functions of sine and cosine because of the boundary conditions to a uh, in some sense, compact support. So you basically anticipate when R for M getting very, very large, this Rm goes to zero. And that provides us a trick with actually computing what lambda is in terms of epsilon. Okay. But in order to actually make that trick, I want to introduce some notation to make it compact, slightly more compact, because if you see you start writing this thing out, with always substituting, say, Rm is equals to 1 over Vm minus R... So, okay, let's say, say R10 is equals to 1 over V10 minus R12. And R12 is eventually, is also equals to 1 over V12 minus R14. And you can go on and on and on and on until eventually it gets large enough. There must be a nice way of writing that. And that's what I'm going to do. And the way we do it is to write it in terms of what you call a continued fraction. So this is actually, I think, a, sort of a thing to explore in algebra. Um, but let's just define it for now. Let us say x 
is equals to the series of numbers. Okay, very often in, in a number of theorems they're actually integers, but we're just going to can be any numbers for now. And by this thing, we actually mean that x is equals to a zero plus one over the next number goes in plus another fraction one over the next number goes in there plus another fraction one over the third number goes in there and you can actually see you can define an infinite series and this fraction grows bigger and bigger and bigger and it's just a nice compact way of writing it now there are other ways of writing this too but this for my purposes of fitting it in is just the best okay and just a number of comments there are a number of theorems of dealing with fractions like that and they are actually very useful in dynamical systems often okay and just for an example as one of the theorems is there um, is like a theorem that every continued fraction is irrational okay every infinite continued fraction in other words if the series becomes infinite it's irrational and for any y that's irrational you can always find a continued fraction um, that expresses it and very often it's a very very compact way of writing the continued fraction for example a very compact way of writing pi is like this okay so it's simply 3 plus 1 over 7 plus 1 over 15 plus 1 over 10 plus 1 over 292 and what's interesting is for the number of digits kept here, it's a much more compact way of actually, a much more accurate way of actually writing down pi than actually working it out and writing down the decimal representation. Okay, so I'm just going to use this notation to basically express what Rm is. Okay, and I'm going to use first of all the, and in some sense I'm going to call the orange, look the orange and the red describe the same entity. The one just describes R writing it in terms of larger R's and the red one describes writing it in terms of smaller ones. So let's just look at the larger ones. So suppose you have R and this is just what I've said previously, you can express it as 1 over Vm minus R2 but then you can again use this expression and simply express R2 as Vm 1 over Vm plus 2 minus R of m plus 4 and then you replace r of m plus 4 by this thing eventually and you can go on and on and on until you get to r infinity in which case you have uh, infinite continued fraction but not of integers because the r's are not the v's are not integers and you can express it that way okay so i'm basically right in the notation i've introduced you would simply have that r m is equals to this. But you now what you can do is you can have, you can express it going the other way. You can express the same Rm simply by working backwards until eventually you have to stop at R4, which you know. So you can say Rm is equals to V minus 2 over 1 over Rm minus 2. And this Rm minus 2, you can again, you go backwards and you can simply say Rm minus 2 is V of M minus 2, 1 over Rm, V M minus 4 over 1 over Rm minus 4. Okay, so over here you're once again building a continued fraction and you can express it this way. Okay, so both these continued fractions are equals to Rm. This one, the lower one, where you've gone backward, you know what R4 is in terms of lambda and epsilon. With this thing, you're going to assume you have a converging solution. In other words, your expansion eventually at, um, for very, very, eventually you can terminate it, say, for M equals to 100, if you're interested in m equals to 4 eigenvalues or m equals to 10 eigenvalues, you can terminate this expansion so you don't have an infinite expansion. And so you actually can, oh sorry, you can actually work out the series as well simply by assuming r of 100 is equals to 0 
and they have to be equal. Okay. Okay, for there to be a valid solution. And the fact is, they are only equal. And this is actually if for specific lambdas. Okay, and that's how you actually fix lambdas. The lambdas um, in the Matei's equation is basically the forcing the expansion to be finite. The expansion is already periodic, but the expansion must just, not, must just be finite for large M. And it must be equal to the expansion coming from the lower sector. In other words, coming from R2 and R4. So the condition that you have a valid lambda that solves the boundary conditions and Matei's equation is simply that this expression the zero must be, in other words, the, the Rm, this expression, must be equal to that expression. Uh, or equivalently that um, basically V over 2 which is R4 must be equals to if you oh, if you evaluate this for a specific say Rm equals to two, and you simply have that a V over two must be equals to that expansion at two. So you have minus V over two over t sorry V zero over two is equals with a continued fraction expressed this way must be equal to zero. Okay, so if you solve this expression, which is an equation, which is an expression only for lambda and epsilon, for lambda given epsilon, then you have a valid lambda m. And similarly, if you're looking at, you can go through the whole same argument for the odd coefficients, and you can get that um, in order for a valid lambda to be found, you must be able to solve this continued fraction. Okay, so the, 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 solu the problem of finding which lambdas are allowed now basically becomes, for these two functions, the problems of finding solutions to this continued fraction expression. And though it seems involved, there's actually a very rapid way of calculating it, which is what makes it so nice and useful. Okay, and we're going to call the roots to these equations or continued fractions equations alpha of 2n and alpha of 2n plus 1. And they are the numbers that are very important to us because we actually want to use them um, to fix, set out the frequencies. So now I'm just going to make a few comments about evaluating it and then give you an example. So in order to evaluate the zero of any function... If you get close enough to the zero, you can um, simply use Newton's method. Okay, so the way we do that is you say, you guess at the zero of f of x, you evaluate f of x at your guess, um, and it's derivative if you can get it, and then for this particular problem it's very, very easy. And then you make your new guess, the old guess, minus f, over the derivative at f of x, at, sorry, at the old guess. So your new guess is simply x, the old guess minus f, evaluated the old guess, guess and over f derivative evaluated the old guess. And so it, if we make an initial guess for, say, lambda, it's very, very easy to evaluate this function and very rapid because it's a continued fraction function. Um, what we now need is to evaluate the derivative of that function at x, and that's actually also very easy because you can use your um, recursion relationships to get that. So simply look at it. Suppose you have Rm, right? So Rm is equals to uh, Vm minus 2 minus 1 over Rm minus 2. So if you just differentiate that with respect to lambda, Vm with respect to derivative with respect to lambda is just one over epsilon. It's a constant, and um, dr, and then it's simply um, the derivative of r m minus two, or minus one of r m minus two, um, and that's simply one over r m minus two squared times the derivative of r m minus two over lambda. So you have a recursive definition for this derivative, which you can, in a computer program, also calculate very, very quickly.
So that is if you're using the backwards difference parts. So, but you can work out the same derivative. And if you're using the backward difference part, you've got to terminate your thing somewhere. So you're simply going to say dr2 d lambda. Work out that derivative and you know it explicitly. It's simply v d v0, which is epsilon, lambda over epsilon, multiplied by the square root of 2. So that's simply equals to 1 over square root 2 epsilon. And you can work out r dr4 over d lambda, and that's simply v2 d d lambda, so that's 1 over epsilon, plus d d lambda of um, 1, oh, so, oh, sorry, of minus 2 over, over v0, and that's simply epsilon over lambda squared. Okay, so you can work out the backward derivative with respect to lambda. And similarly, you can work out the forward derivative with respect to lambda just by taking the derivative over here. And you have dd lambda of rm is just 1 over this thing squared, which turns out to be rm 1 over, which, yeah, which turns out to be um, uh, rm squared times minus the derivative of this whole thing, which is simply drm plus 2 d lambda minus 1 of epsilon. So you have a recursive definition for the forward difference of lambda as well, of the derivative with respect to lambda as well. And the procedure for now, for working out lamb the, the correct lambda, is simply start with an initial guess of alpha 2n. Okay? And a very good initial guess is simply 2n squared, because we know that if epsilon is equal to 0, the eigenvalues are simply um, 2n squared. Okay, so we're starting with our guess at epsilon equals to 0. So we choose x0 is equal to 2n squared. And then we choose the epsilon we're interested in. And we evaluate r 2n l. And that, by that I mean the left one, and so what I've been calling the backwards thing. So we evaluate this using the recursion relationships in red. So in other words, we're going backwards to R4 and R3. We evaluate its derivative using those recursion relationships, which is very, very fast to program. And we also evaluate the ones that go right. In other words, the ones that write R2n in terms of your um, these r's that go to infinity and we work out the derivative using this orange relationship okay and then we assume that for some m large enough rm and its derivative go to zero which is a valid assumption if you just have a if you if your expansion is not going to explode and then we say okay our next guess for the eigenvalue is in just the old one, minus R2 in um, L, the one going left, um, minus the one going right, because we want those two things to be equals, divided by the derivative of the one going left and the one going right. Okay. And that will then work out for basically what our eigen or lambda, the discrete values of lambda that they actually are. The one thing I must have to say is you have to be, before you start this method, you actually have to be close enough to your ideal value. So another, there's, there are other zero-finding methods which will actually get you close enough. What you basically do is start with this initial guess, evaluate it there, see if the function is negative or positive, and then find another point at which it is, change a sign simply by plotting it, say, and then go to that other point, and then once you're close enough, then, um, then you start this type of iteration, and you get there very, very rapidly. So let's look at an example. So if, remember, I plotted the graph of the zeros for the proof in, the pr in lecture, what's it, 25, for epsilon equals to a half. And so if you work out this method, you can find that the eigenvalues for if epsilon is a half is simply... The first eigenvalue at which the, the series is actually finite, you have 1.4. The next one is 4.1. Then you have 
um, 9.3, um, four point, the one for four is 16, the one for five is 25, and the one for six is 36. So it's very, very close to n squared, right? If you look at it carefully, okay? And you know it's got to be close to n squared because when epsilon is zero, it is exactly n squared. Okay, and now the cool thing is once you've established basically lambda this way and you know what epsilon is, then you just push it into the recursion relationship and you work out the coefficients in your expansion. So, for example, C5, you then go and work out C, CE5. You put in alpha 5 into that recursion relationship expansion. You put in epsilon equals to a half. And then you can work out the coefficients exactly. And here they are. Okay, so if you want to go through it yourself and just check, this is what you then get. So your Matei's equation at epsilon equals to a half the, for the eigenfunction um, that has lambda basically has a lambda equals to very close to 25, which is n squared, is equals to this one. Okay, so that's the eigenfunction is simply there's a component from cos x, there's a component from cos 3x. The major component as to be anticipated is cos 5x, right? Because note that if, if as epsilon goes to zero, this becomes one and the others all vanish. Okay. So there's a smooth change from sine and cosine that are solutions to the spherical problem where epsilon is equal to zero to the more general Matei's equation where you then start writing out this eigen solution in terms of your basis of sine and cosine. And people have worked this, it's actually reasonably easy if you're going to do like research or anything in this to actually write a computer program that does this. Um, and, but another place to actually go and check, in fact, a place to go that's a very good reference for any solution to a Stromerville equation, basically all the most important Stromerville equations have been catalogued there, is this place. It's called the Digital Library of Mathematical Functions. It used to be a text or a like the reference for mathematical or applied mathematics and physics, um, Abramovich and Stegen. But now there's an online version which is exceedingly useful and it has all the properties of your Stimulable equations because they're used so often, uh, in addition to a whole bunch of other things that's worthwhile knowing about. And it's hosted at this website. Okay. They call it yeah, basically Digital Library of Mathematical Functions. It's at NIST. That's the sort of a research center in the U.S. that's supported by the U.S. government. And Matei's equations is at chapter 28.3. Okay, so if you want more explanation to what I've just spoken about, please go there. Um, and anyway, so I took this figure from there, but I actually wanted to tell you about this reference place as well. So this is a picture of the zeros of Matei's equation. That, and how they depend, or the, the eigenvalues of Matei's equation, and how they depend on epsilon. So here you can see when epsilon is equal to zero, it's just what we've derived. And what we derived in the previous slide are basically the blue lines. Okay, and alpha is A in their, their textbook. So we basically, or the, in their thing. So we basically derived the blue lines, or the way of computing the blue lines. Um, and you can see here the blue lines occur at... Um, 0, 1, 4, 9, 16. And the these values that we calculated over here is basically at sitting over there. So they're very, very close to the... So epsilon is equals to a half. What is interesting is as epsilon goes, gets larger, in other words, as you increase the eccentricity of your lips, effectively, these lines tend to shift. Okay, so... By changing your eccentricity of your lips, you can actually change the frequencies of your drum or the frequencies of your loudspeaker, which is what caused Matei to explore these functions in the first place. Okay, um, so those are all the A's. What is interesting, so the A's basically correspond to the even solutions. In other words, the solutions that correspond to cosine series, as I've seen here. 
what w the solutions, these red lines, actually refer to the eigenvalues when you are looking at the sine series. So down there. And when you look at the sine series, what, it, what is very, very interesting is it, it tends to change. Right? So if you're looking at a cylinder, or oh, sorry, at a sphere around sort of membrane, the sine and the cosine frequencies are the same. Okay? And, but if you become more and more elliptical, they drift away from each other. And the reason they drift away from each other is that it's basically your membrane that's changing. In some sense, the odd functions, which is the sine functions, are sort of more sensitive to the axes that get smaller, whereas the symmetrical functions, the cosine functions, are sort of more symmetrical, sort of lie on the x-axis that sort of remains large. Okay, and you can actually see that when you go back to the nodes I gave right at the beginning of the talk. So that basically explains why your frequencies start changing in different ways depending on whether you have an odd or an, sorry, an even or an odd function, in other words, in N. In other words, your, whether you have the, the cosine expansion, the blue, or you have the sine expansion in the red. Okay. And so just to write out the same way in which these red functions have been computed, they basically refer to the sine in X, uh, or the even ones, and the sine 2N plus 1, which is basically the odd sine expansions. And the same method that I mentioned in the previous slide that, was used to that I used to calculate these values, it simply can be found there too. Okay, so you use the same tick, it's the same V, and you here instead of having R, you, you use R hat, and that's the ratio of BM over BM minus 2. And you write down the recursion relationships for R with the initial starting values like that. And this just comes directly from the recursion relationships we were derived in the beginning. Um, you work out the derivatives because you need that to compute the, the finding of the zeros. It's just faster. There are other ways of doing it. So the two derivatives are the same. And then you have the recursion rate relationship if M is greater than or equals to 3. That's exactly the same as the R recursion relationship. So you've seen this before. Um, the derivative is also the same. And so it's exactly the same method. Then you use the update scheme that I gave on the previous slide to actually find the next approximant, both the forward way and the backward way. And you, that's how you compute. And the place where the two, the forward and the backward, are eventually zero is when the algorithm terminates, and that's how you compute these red lines. Okay, so it's kind of nice to see how the geometry is actually coming into the actual frequencies of your membrane itself. Okay, and just writing out these eigenvalue conditions, okay, they're exactly the same for the large M, but over here they change slightly. In other words, you basically have that V2 is equals to R hat 4, so R at 4, the expansion forward, is simply um, given by, where is him, by the forward expression, this one. So that's basically V4 um, minus 1 over V6 plus R6, etc. Okay, so this is this expansion. So this is the condition for your even M. And the condition for your odd M is basically that V3 must be equals to that. So V1 plus 1 is equals to the expansion V3. And that must be equals to 0. So you have minus 1 minus V1 is equals to continued fraction expansion for V3. And if you find the zeros of these two expressions, you then get these red lines. Um, and they only significantly depart. It's, some, it's a very interesting structure, and it's been used a lot of places um, to actually find how membranes vibrate, how you choose certain fiber optic paths and things like that. There's a lot of applications to this, and it's simply the frequencies that change as a function of lambda. Okay, just another interesting thing is the actual eigenfunctions also change. So as I mentioned here,
If you look at this example, we can expand Matei's equation with lambda equals to this eigenfunction using these causes, where you still have the major part of the expansion being cos 5x, okay, because alpha is 25. Um, the same thing remains true for the same property remains true. In fact, the, the eigenfunctions associated, say, with the fifth eigenvalue change is epsilon changes, but not dramatically. So we basically here have the dependence on your, of your eigenfunctions on uh, epsilon. Here we have epsilon equals to 1 over here, and here we have epsilon equals to 10. And what you can see happening is that, so here is the CE0, which becomes that one. Okay, so there's not a dramatic change in the shape of the eigenfunctions. They just tend to be squashed down a little bit, in other words, here, and be shifted towards, this thing only goes over to pi over 2, and get shifted towards, um, in some sense, the, the x equal to 0 axis in your physical domain. Okay, so it's a distortion rather than a geometric change of your eigenfunctions. Uh, and what's nice about Matei's equation is you can actually get them explicitly if you use those recurrence relationships and the projection onto the other the eigenfunctions. Here is just the, the sign, so the odd-valued functions, and you see the same thing happening. So here is epsilon equals to 1. Okay, so here they're still very much just sine and cosine functions. In fact, if you look at this particular one, right, that's just almost a sine function, whereas when q is equals to 10, it's a much more distorted function that looks something like that. Okay, so it's just, and all this, and the nice thing is this is going to be analytically calculated. So that basically concludes my exploration of Matei's equations, the angular part, and the lecture I'll just have a look at the radial part. And that will basically bring us almost to the end of this course in PDEs, although I might try and do two lectures on the KDV equation, because it's also an interesting, it's a one an example of a nonlinear equation that's worthwhile solving. Thank you very much.